grow your behavioral health practice and reach more clients who need your help, we have just the solution for you. Psych Hub Provider Learning Hubs are your answer. We will train you in the greatest information on evidence-based practice delivered by industry experts in a state-of-the-art way. And at the end of it, you will earn a certification in how to use these interventions to treat anxiety, depression, insomnia, you name it. And then when you finish, you unlock a whole library of resources for ongoing learning for you as the provider, but to share with your patient. How great is it to let your patient know in a quick video, here's what to expect from your therapy session. And then any exercise or activities that happen in session, we have videos to help reinforce those skills at home for your patients, as easy as just sending a quick text or emailing them. It is a revolutionary new way to really get people through treatment, getting the best symptom results and engaging your patient along the way. Visit psychhub.com learning to get started. Hi, I'm Marjorie Morrison. And this is Patrick Kennedy. And you are listening to the Psych Hub podcast, The Future of Mental Health. On this week's episode of The Future of Mental Health, we sit down with Dr. Nicholas Carderis, an expert in tech addiction. Patrick loves this episode because he can completely relate having five young children. And while my kids are grown, it's still fascinating to learn about how screen exposure is taking a toll on our mental health. Studies show that excessive use can damage a young person's developing brain similar to the same way that cocaine addiction can. Now, that's not to say that all technology is bad, but in his book, Glow Kids, he makes the case that we need to take into account what the long-term implications are of having future generations' eyes constantly glued to a screen. We, in this episode, will, will cover the need for monitoring tech use and more advocacy in this area. This episode is going to make all of us think twice about how much screen time we and our kids have. I hope you enjoy. Dr. K, we are so excited to have you on the show today. You you are a, a true expert in an area that is affecting so many people when we think about tech addiction. I mean, 96% of Americans have smartphones and... I mean, I just saw the statistic that to me is so staggering that teens that spend more than five hours a day on their phone are 71% more likely to experience suicide risk factors. I mean, that's, that's a very, very scary, scary stat. And about half of parents believe their children are addicted to their smartphones. So I'm just curious as you, this is your area of expertise At what point did you realize that society had a tech addiction problem? Was there like a defining moment for you? And how did you begin your research? Yeah, well, and by the way, it's uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's it's really great to be here and to talk about this critically important subject, which we're all swimming in right now. You know, we're awash in technology and its effects. So I think because I'm a human being that has eyes, I began to realize, you know, about a little over a decade ago that there was something happening, that the temperature was rising in terms of some of the impacts of technology, especially with young, younger people and with children. And I was, uh, I was running a, a, a substance abuse rehab in New York, and I was doing a lot of work with addiction. I was a professor at Stony Brook Medical teaching addiction treatment and mental health. But I also did a lot of work at school districts. And I started seeing some of the clinical, you know, what looked like the clinical signs of addiction around screen time. So this is about 13, 14 years ago, when technology was really beginning to sort of get unleashed into the society. But my, I guess you could say my, my tipping point was when I had a young man that was referred to me about, it's been about nine or 10 years ago now, who came into my office. And I talk about this in my book, Glow Kids. He was in a full blown psychotic state. He didn't know where he was. He was blinking really, uh, you know, excessively. Um, He was suffering from what we call derealization. He didn't know uh, where he was. He didn't know who he was. And as he continued to blink, and I kept asking him orienting questions, who are you? Do you know where you are? After about two two or three minutes, he said, are we still in the game? And uh, I said, no, we're not in the game. And I came to find out that he had been playing World of Warcraft for 10 to 12 hours a day and had essentially fallen into the matrix. He He couldn't discern where the game ended and where reality began for him. 
And I was very used to dealing with substance induced derealization from, you know, bad acid trips to crystal meth psychosis, but I'd never seen gaming induced psychosis. And that young man had to be psychiatrically hospitalized for a period of time and was put on antipsychotics, which were not the appropriate course of action uh, because he wasn't truly psychotic. It was, he was sleep deprived and reality blurred because of his screen immersion. And that was my first, you know, aha moment. This is something new and strange that's happening. Um, so I think that was probably my tipping point. And then from then on, just seeing um, the clinical impacts, you know, kids with the, ten the, the spikes in ADHD, the spikes in depression, the spikes in, in all sorts of other mental health metrics. And, and if I can say it, that's the main issue, I think, if I can hammer one issue home, it's less about tech addiction and more about what our obsession with technology is doing to our mental health. It's acting as an accelerant. It's kerosene on our mental health. So it's increasing. Um, we weren't genetically meant to be isolated, screen staring, sedentary, meaning devoid beings. It's not in our DNA. So when you take a society and when you do what technology has been doing to us, we're seeing a rise, a, a huge spike in all the mental health metrics. It's so scary, really, just to think about what, where we're at and where we could be going. I mean, that, that's a frightening story that you just told. I mean, a, a blurred reality. I mean, there's so many parents out there who worry that their kids are on too much screen time or playing games too much. And especially in COVID where they're, you know, we've been on lockdown and your parents have to work and it's maybe they're more likely to let their kids have more screen time because they don't have as many options. Are you seeing an increase of it now more than you have before? And can you tell us a little bit about Glow Kids, the book? Yeah, well, unquestionably, we're seeing an increase through COVID. Uh, COVID has been a nuclear bomb to screen time. Um, if screen time was an issue before, which it was, you know, I wrote I wrote my op-ed for the New York Post Digital Heroin about four years ago, where I analogize that this is the new drug. This is the new seductive uh, habit forming uh, compulsion that most or many people were falling victim to, and now add COVID, where we're quarantined and we're we're, we're essentially forced to be. Uh, screen-based to communicate, to get along. So um, so what we're seeing is kids who are more vulnerable to these effects are getting more profoundly impacted, and especially kids who have underlying vulnerabilities. So spectrum children, kids who are already, already prone towards anxiety or depression, now they're more isolated. Now they're more, you know, so we've seen, I've seen teenagers who are really struggling psychiatrically in a way that we've never seen before. The numbers are really off the charts. Um, suicide rates amongst adolescents had doubled in the last 10 years before COVID. And there's been a lot of research correlating screen time, as you had mentioned that, you know, being on a screen for five hours or more increased suicidality by 71%. Now add COVID to that, and that, that number's already gone up significantly. So, so my book, Glow Kids, which you uh, asked about, uh, so I wrote Glow Kids in 2016. And Back then, I got a lot of pushback, even saying that there's a thing called technology addiction. There was a big debate amongst people in my field, addiction psychologists, is this a real addiction? And, you know, my response is if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's, it's an addiction. If it's beginning to destroy people's lives, which it clearly was, I was getting clients referred to me who were getting devastated by their screen time. They were losing, they were, they were flunking out of school, they were losing their careers, they were... Um, becoming non-functional. I mean, essentially, there, I was working with failure to launch young, really smart young, oftentimes males, oftentimes males have the gaming problem. And there's a little bit of a gender divide. Females have some of the social media impacts more disproportionately. But many of them were becoming dysfunctional in society, not able to live a day-to-day -day life. And so this looked like the new escape. This looked like the new ubiquitous way for people to numb or check out of their daily reality. And so I wrote Glow Kids as sort of a, a primer uh, where I compiled all the 200 peer reviewed studies that correlated screen time with the whole host of not wonderful clinical impacts uh, as a handbook for parents, for families, for people struggling. And, um, and since then it's, you know, it's been in 11 languages and it's sold well throughout the world because people finally woke up to that maybe the shiny seductive devices that we've all fallen in love with, maybe this dark side to our tech obsession. 
I wanted to ask about treatment and what, in most cases, we always think about mental health treatment after it's a crisis. You know, that's mm. the whole paradigm of treatment for addiction is wait until you're almost at death's door and your illness has taken you down and, uh, and then, you know, get an intervention and then get put in a, you know, 30 day inpatient, you know, so forth. We have just not envisioned as a society, a healthcare system that kind of screens, if you will, no pun intended for this early in one's life also maps that to their risk, uh, for addiction or, you know, keeps track of this on, on an EMR in much the same way as we track all these other illnesses on the EMR with a set of, you know, protocols and questions for the attending physicians and any office in the country that's doing a medical exam to ask so that they could input it so that we could get a better read on how people are doing. What's your kind of vision for the future in terms of addressing this, um, this addiction, uh, uh, understanding that you know, in many respects, it may share a common template of recovery as others, but it'd just be interesting to hear maybe also how do you go upstream and um, what is happening out there in terms of helping us uh, keep it to keep as many people falling off uh, the edge because of our neglect for this as a serious problem? Thank you, Patrick. That's such a great question in terms of how do we keep people from falling off the cliff. And what you're really talking about is prevention versus treatment. And you know, right now in the United States, as you know, our mental health and our medical system is a reactive treatment-based model. And look, I'm a treatment provider. I run treatment programs around the country. I run the program Omega Recovery, where we treat young adult mental health and we specialize in tech addiction and screen issues. But the whole, the whole solution here is prevention-based rather than treatment-based. So what does that mean? That means, can we create a program to identify problems on the front end. And I think that's a fairly simple solution. So if I were waving my magic wand and we were able to create, a, a, it's a fairly simple program. It would be called the National Mental Health Awareness and Assessment Day. And one day a year within schools, public schools would be dedicated to mental health awareness and assessment. So the schools would create assessments for a variety of mental health issues depression assessments, anxiety, self-harm, screen time. So we would get a sense of the flavor. If any young people are struggling, how they would score in these assessments would be a guide to then giving them referrals to help if they choose to so uh, avail themselves of that help. We wouldn't be mandating treatment or anything like that, but we would be creating more uh, awareness on the front end so people can get the help before the problem gets worse. Because as you and I both know, it's harder to fix something than it is to prevent something. So this could be a simple legislative swipe of the pen um, where school funding is based on providing these mental health assessments one day a year. Uh, my suggestion would be fifth grade, eighth grade, and 10th grade. Uh, those are the sort of pivotal developmental years where you want to identify if there's a higher risk for depression and self-harm and, and screen time. And, and so right now in schools, we do for the committees on special education, which I've done a lot of work around, it's only those students who have really, uh, really gone over the edge with behaviorally or have red flagged themselves who then get evaluated or tested. Um, and it's somewhat stigmatizing and it's somewhat problematic in that sense because it's only a small number of kids who have already crossed a certain line who are getting tested. Well, so this would be less stigmatizing, would be essentially almost a fun day of education and programming around different mental health issues. Oh, and by the way, we're all going to take a couple of hours of assessments. And at the end of those assessments, we have, we have tools, we have some metrics to guide um, which students might need more support. It, a fairly simple fix, and I would love to be able to get behind an initiative to create this program, which I think we can get a lot of support around. And let's face it, you want to know that kid who's struggling and who feels like they want, might want to hurt themselves or potentially hurt other people too. Let's face it, we've had a massive school shootings. We've had an epidemic of suicides. Let, let's find out who those kids are so we can give them the help that they need. That's what I would love to see. And I would love to partner up with whatever group is necessary to create that initiative, whether that's, you know, the stakeholders would be uh, the, the parents, the PTA, the school systems, the legislators to create this initiative. I mean, we have to get 
students uh, screened in schools for vaccinations. Kids get assessed for a whole variety of other issues. Uh, the school setting seems to be the natural setting to do this for our young people. That's what I'd like to see, Patrick. Your, your book, your work, obviously highlights the challenge. Um, I think we're at a watershed moment in terms of society's um, appreciation for how critical good mental health is. You're seeing that from the business community. They're wanting to offer much more than the traditional EAP. And they're, they're all knocking their uh, third-party administrators to provide much more uh, in-network benefits for their employees. I mean, there's just a much more intentional approach from the movers and shakers of this world uh, to highlight the significance of, of making a good investment in your mental health, your resilience, and so forth. So we're now in a moment where we're back to school, so to speak. It's return to school um, that has generated more money than we've ever seen in terms of the opportunity to transform our education, to be more intentional about um, social emotional development, and uh, ensuring that there's adequate mental health um, services in the public school system, since they're like the front lines for, for our society as a community resource, every community in the country. Um, could you talk about sort of like the opportunities here in a broader sense? Because we're really, what I'm looking for is a public health approach. You know, we're never going to be able to build our way out of this in terms of treatment if we're not doing more to preempt, you know, uh, mental illness by seeing these telltale signs that you've spent your life trying to point out to the rest of us. Tell us a little bit about what you would like to see in a new curricula if we were to re-examine and think how do schools operate? What's their function to prepare the next generation? So we know that schools are where our children spend the predominant part of their days. You know, we as parents have them for the minority of the time and really school is their focal point. And there was a movement afoot before COVID for uh, distance learning and for uh, online learning. And, and a lot of it, I have to say, was financially driven. Um, there were entrepreneurs who were very motivated to create a, a online curriculum for children. And Patrick, to your point about social emotional learning, um, screen education will not allow for that rich, robust environment where kids need socialization, they need character development, they need mentoring, they need the Socratic circle, the Socratic dialectic to really have the engaged social interactive approach. So before COVID, I wrote an op-ed for Time Magazine about three years ago, and they're actually rerunning it in um, next month. Time Magazine is running a, an issue called The Future of Education, and they've asked to rerun my article, which was uh, really a critical look at the movement to create screen-based education. And, and what I was trying to point out is it's opening up a Pandora's box of overly uh, exposing our kids to this unhealthy way of being that we need more teachers in the classroom with more social emotional supports, more social workers, more psychologists. We don't need to be putting our kids in front of screens longer. That's been part of the problem. And so, but beyond that, from a pedagogical standpoint, there was no research that showed that uh, screen learning was efficacious. There was no, not one study shows that a kid on a Chromebook is, has better educational outcomes when he's in middle school or high school or in college. And in fact, what we know is that even our, our most powerful tech leaders, we know that Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the Google boys, were Montessori students. We know that Jeff Bezos was a Montessori student. We know that some of the most powerful minds in, in our world today had more traditional, uh, let's call it hands-on, interpersonal types of educational settings. They weren't stuck in front of a computer screen. They never would have gotten to where they've gotten it had they been. And so we have to understand that as much as we may love our technology, and my message isn't that of a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology. My message is age-appropriate technology and nurturing social, emotional, mental health in, in a naturalistic setting uh, because we've gone away from our genetic heritage, our generic, um, we're a social species because the tribe survived. We need social face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, we need physical movement. So we need all these things baked into our curriculum 
from K through eight. We can't think that we're going to um, um, somehow bypass all these issues and just drop technology into our kids. There's a false narrative that we're going to be behind technologically in this very technological age if we don't start Johnny and Susie on, on, on a computer screen by kindergarten. And what's happened over the last seven to eight years is that the Chromebook movement has gone from high school to eighth grade to sixth grade to fourth grade to kindergarten. And so we're doing real developmental and clinical mental health damage by this uh, false narrative of, of unleashing the digital hounds on our kids at too young of an age. And so I think what we need to do now, we, we have to come to an, an awareness moment and say, look, technology is wonderful. But let's do what they do in Finland. Finland has said, let's not have individualized screens in the classroom. Let's, and, and they have the highest, by the way, the highest educational outcomes in the world, Finland. They've rejected the individual screen model as being uh, detrimental and distracting and clinically not sound and educationally not sound. So let's invest in, in we don't have to be education disruptors because everybody jumps to this idea that we have to really just rock the apple cart whole cloth to get better outcomes. Um, change isn't always good, you know, change, beneficial change is good, but some change can be bad. And I think we're seeing now with COVID that uh, Zoom schooling has been a disaster. We're seeing kids struggling in ways that we've never seen before. We've seen suicide rates that we've never seen before. So, so we have to take a step back to your point, Patrick, and create a social emotional learning model that, that fosters education. I'd like to see more uh, civics and character development, because that's also been v vacuumed out in sort of what we might call a value neutral setting. Because part of it is a lot of our young, a lot of our young people are, are untethered to a sense of bearing, a sense of mooring, a sense of up and down, a sense of, um, of, of uh, well, what we would call traditional character development. And, and I know that could be a third rail that could be problematic because, you know, that could be very subjective in some sense. But I know when I speak to young people, they're starved for direction. And, and our world right now for, for the adults in the room is a very confusing place, much less for the eight or the 10 or the 14 year old. So, so that framework needs to be put in place. Uh, we need to kind of pump the brakes on the, uh, uh, our, our drunken infatuation with technology as the panacea, because it's the opposite. Calling all mental health providers, looking to specialize in treating adolescents? Check out PsychHub's Cognitive Behavioral Therapy courses. Receive specialized certifications and hone in on your skills. Get one-year access to patient videos and worksheets that you can email or text to your clients to keep them engaged in between sessions. Plus, you'll be placed on the PsychHub registry, where consumers of mental health who are searching for certified providers that are specialized in their condition can find you. To learn more about CBT for adolescent training, visit psychhub.com learning. Let me just thank you for your uh, advocacy. And I'm, I'm uh, as a politician, wondering how do we create a movement that takes this message um, and ensures that um, we do pump the brakes? Because short of organizing um, a narrative and an advocacy that uh, surrounds these principles that you're talking about, the need to be safeguarding our kids, you know, health, spiritual health, emotional, social health, um, we're, we're all going to uh, suffer for it. And so if there are going to be huge consequences that uh, we're going to end up paying, and if we're given the warning that it doesn't have to be this way, but here are the things that we need to do, then um, where does that movement get started? Um, where do you find alignment with institutional players that are um, automatic believers? My, my wife's a public school teacher, 14 years, sees her kids in the classroom, knows their suffering, makes them impossible for them to learn trauma, so forth. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I would think that the labor unions that represent teachers would be naturally a, a, a natural ally. I'm not sh sure though. I mean, uh, they, the teachers now use a lot of technology in order to impart their lesson plans, you know, and, you know, even for them, it becomes a, a, a facilitating tool for them to 
uh, reach their kids. And so, you know, I imagine many of them would be resistant, be resistant because it's now become incorporated so much into uh, mainstream education. The parent teachers or, uh, associations who are um, the burgeoning kind of mm-hmm. um, advocates uh, for this uh, concern that you're you're so articulating right now yeah it's it's really interesting there seems to be now a grassroots movement where there are certain parents who are waking up to this issue and there are certain school administrators who are waking up to this issue i've been asked to speak at several education conferences national conferences around the country and it was interesting because you know when i go speak at a national education conference and i'm there basically saying a lot of a lot of you are uh heading down the wrong path um, there's an understanding and, well, the, and what the issue Patrick is it's 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 a career issue right many administrators are being there's pressure applied right whether it's from the superintendents or from some of the wealthier families that we have to keep up with district Y because now they've invested X amount in technology and, and, and it's a feeling of our children will somehow be behind if we don't do a similar investment in our district and it's the emperor has no clothes and I mean, literally, I say, show me the one study of, that shows the efficacy of these devices in the classroom. Just show me one study that shows that. And I get some version of humana, humana, humana. Um, and so there's parents that are waking up. There's a, a mother in Maryland who got together with her local state legislators. And she was so smart. She, it was so interesting what she did. She was concerned about her four children in elementary school and the the onslaught of screen time that uh, was being forced upon them. And she partnered up with two legislators and they wrote a law or they proposed a bill to limit screen time in this classroom is based on OSHA guidelines because OSHA for office safety had screen time guidelines just from an ocular standpoint. It's just not good for our eyes. And so she used that as the sword to really get two legislators on board to propose a bill to say, you know, no more than two hours of screen time for kids in Maryland classrooms. And she got a lot of uh, media attention and she was able to partner up with state legislators to at least at least pump the brakes and limit the amount of screen time. And, and so I think partnering up parents, PTA administrators and politicians at the local level and saying, we don't have to drink the Kool-Aid that big tech is selling us because the ones, and I'll give you the perfect example in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Union Free School District uh, the superintendent was John Deasy. And John Deasy, by all accounts, I've, we have colleagues, mutual colleagues. He's a good man by all accounts, but he had been wined and dined by a big tech in the same way that many well-intentioned primary care physicians are wined and dined by big pharma. And, and if you Google the $1.3 billion um, Apple fiasco for the union, for the LA school district, they invested $1.3 billion in, uh, iPads, Pearson software, all of it was half-baked. None of it was effective. It, it came at a period when they were accessing hundreds of teachers and it wasn't bid properly. The FBI investigated and at the end of six months, everything was shelved. It was such a huge waste of taxpayer dollars, but it was this, this false, you know, this uh, Quixote-like pursuit of thinking technology was going to solve things. And to his misguided credit, John Deasy, the superintendent said, I f- technology will level the playing field, that we have disparate learning situations for poor socioeconomic families, giving them uh, an iPad will level the playing field with some of their wealthier uh, classmates. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. What the research has shown is that kids from poor socioeconomic uh, backgrounds who get unfettered access to technology begin to do poorer because they don't have the oversight on what they're doing with their technology. So now they're, they're, they're gaming, they're doing porn, whatever it may be, everything except schoolwork. So it was well-intentioned, but not well thought out and, and, and fueled by greedy big tech companies that just see these as financial opportunities. So we have to, as the consumers, and as the politicians and as the parents say, enough, we don't, we don't see the, the value of these devices, uh, at, certainly not in elementary school. My wife is also a public school teacher, Patrick, also for 15 years. And, you know, she, like your wife, has seen the change in her first graders over the last 10 years. 
in terms of their ability to make eye contact, their ability to focus, their ability to attend to the classroom. So we're, we're doing damage to our kids. And I think, I do feel over the last five years that I've been uh, putting this message out there that there is an awakening and uh, where we could say, yes, we, we, we approve of technology, but it's like anything else. It's like my, my automobile, my car. I love my car, but I'm not going to give my seven-year-old the car keys. We want to like figure out how do we add some fuel to the fire in your um, movement and like, who are the, what are the right organizations that you think are simpatico with what you're trying to do? There are two major class action lawsuit uh, law firms that are really set their sights on big tech and really taking aim exactly in the same way that big, that we did against big tobacco. Big tech knows the clinically damaging impact of these devices. They've laid out their playbook. They've said we've made them habit forming by design. Sean Parker, the first president of Facebook has clearly said this. He said this on record. He said this on camera. Um, they hire the top behavioral psychologists to manipulate our children, but more, well, not more problematically, but they've also manipulated us as the parents, right? The Kool-Aid they gave to our, well, they've just seduced our kids because it's just seductive candy. And our kids, you know, they don't have the fully developed uh, frontal cortexes to say no to something so compelling. But what they've done to the parents is they've brainwashed us to somehow think that this is somehow educational or beneficial, or these devices are somehow helpful to our children. And we drank that Kool-Aid. And, and what we're seeing now is there's a lot of parental guilt. So when I speak to an auditorium of three or 400 parents, you know, there could be psychologists, but half of them or most of them are parents. I could tell right away who's feels guilty that, oh my God, you know, I let my two-year-old down too early. And now it's a hard pill for them to swallow, to admit that maybe I inadvertently did something that damaged my child. So they put their heads in the sand to some degree. To some degree, it's a hard message for parents to accept that maybe I did the wrong thing. But what I try to say is, you didn't do the, you didn't do the wrong thing. You did what you thought was best for your child, right? But we've been lied to. We've been manipulated. We've been um, uh, manipulated. And and when I talk to teenagers, this is almost one of the most effective strategies. When you talk to gamers and you say, you know, and you show them some of the big tech players talking about their behavior modification techniques that they bake into their platforms the kids get angry, like, what? I'm being manipulated like that? I don't want to just be some some consumer droid that's being manipulated by some big tech uh, monopoly. And, and that's the pushback that I think we need to push back. So whether it's class action lawsuits, uh, litigation, we've I've been trying to fight for a movement similar to tobacco, at least put warning labels on, at least warn that excessive screen time can lead to clinical disorders for some children at least give the parents that basic warning, but they're not willing to go there yet. You know, at least uh, big alcohol and big tobacco, whether it's for public relations or not, at least they're investing in PSA announcements saying, you know, uh, the NFL does that. The NFL says, you know, we don't condone gambling, but if you do happen to develop a gambling problem, here are some treatment resources. Big tech hasn't taken that step yet. They haven't taken the step to acknowledge that they could even be the potential for a problem with any of these devices. And so they're not willing to give a warning to offer some supports for treatment or prevention or education. They're just in, I hate to say it, in an insulated bulletproof tower right now. And until the consumers speak back loudly and the class action lawsuits maybe have a financial impact and legislation begins to limit some of these things, they're gonna keep doing what they're doing to our detriment. Um, So, Whatever help we can do to cobble together a a movement is critical now. And again, I don't think anyone is saying we want to be Amish and be Luddites. You know, we're not saying do away with technology, but we're saying look at the mental health metrics to your point, Patrick. Uh, ADHD has gone up 50% in the last 10 years. Suicide rates have doubled. Depression is at an all-time high, even though we've tripled the amount of antidepressants and SSRIs that we've thrown at the problem. Um, uh, Self-harm personality disorders. We haven't even talked about personality disorders. I'm fairly convinced that social media is shaping some of the borderline personality disorder epidemic because borderline personality disorder is typified by black and white, non-nuanced reactive thinking. And let's face it, if you are shaped by the Twitter sphere or by very um, polarizing social media, 
you're not going to be a very nuanced thinker and your self-concept is going to be defined in a problematic way. There's a whole host of complex ways that we're negatively impacting young people. We haven't even talked about the um, sapping of creativity. Uh, young people that are raised on uh, high impact stimulation are profoundly non-creative. They can't write me a story or draw a picture because the visual imagery has been programmed into their minds in a way that's been so problematic. So their creativity atrophies, their attentional abilities atrophy. There was the JAMA study they showed in the Journal of American Medical Association two years ago that looked at children on screens, The the because there's been over 12 now brain imaging studies that clearly show the impact on the brain. And in infants, it shows that the executive function, the frontal cortex, the myelination atrophies. Um, there's been several other studies that show that the gray matter, what's called the DGM, the, den uh, the, the, um, the dense gray matter of the prefrontal cortex shrinks over time with too much screen time in the same way that it does with chronic substance abuse. That's why we're analogizing these two uh, digital drugs. So if you have a compromised executive functioning part of your brain, that goes back to the impulsivity that I was talking about. That goes back to a lot of a host of issues that we're exposing our young people to under this false premise of keeping up with the, the Joneses in this technological arms race that we feel we're going to be left behind on. Meanwhile, we need to be making healthy, uh, uh, psychologically strong, mentally well young adults because that's going to be who's going to be best able to serve our society, not not these little zombified, uh, screen seduced children uh, and and parents who are not able to kind of find their voice to say here and no further with what you're doing to my child. It's almost just depressing listening to it because you you know you bring up just so many valid points that I think everybody can agree with. As we wrap up, do you have any advice uh, for parents, for for kids to, you know, kind of try to help remedy some of these things in their own hands? Yeah. So, you know, there was a wait until eighth movement. You know, my my I have 13 year old twin boys as well, Patrick, and um, not as well, but 13 year olds. And uh, we haven't let them have a phone. We've nurtured their musical interests and their sports interests. and you know, we're swimming against the tide. If you want to be a tech cautious parent, you're swimming against the tide. So you have to be more proactive in, in what you expose your kids to, the quality time that you spend to them. Patrick, what you said is, you know, I'm Greek. We were raised to be a very emotive family. We hug, we show love, we make eye contact. They, the research has showed, you know, it's funny before you mentioned ACEs and adverse childhood experiences, what we're also robbing our kids from because the intervening piece that's missing in the ACEs model is the resilience that that somebody who has struggled through some adversity can develop. But screen raised children are insulated from developing resilience. And so a lot of these kids are profoundly fragile. You know, we talk about fragility, psychological fragility. Um, so creating opportunities to our kids to develop a sense of resilience, a sense of uh, empowerment to be able to do things, you know, uh, hands on in a way that's healthy. The one thing that parents need to really do is to be present when they're with their kids. Um, this phenomenon of distracted parent syndrome, where the mm -hmm. parent thinks they're there, I'm home with my kid, but I'm on my device. And what the research showed with that is that that leads to a worse outcome than if the parent's just not even home and out of the house. Because at least if the parent's away, the child interprets that as, all right, mom and dad are gone. But if mom and dad are in the room and they're rejecting my, my presence, the child interprets that as much more profoundly abandoning than if the parent wasn't there. So we talk about attachment disorders and kids who are now developed this crisis of attachment. So make spend quality time with your children. I do a one day of unplugging with the whole family where none of us watches a TV or gets on the device. And we spend a day of just doing stuff together, you know, whether that's uh, a board game or playing sports or going to the park or whatever that is. Um, being mindful, being mindful parents and being aware of this because, you know, we're so tech addicted, we're not noticing what's happening to our, our younger, more vulnerable ones. So that would be my advice just to wake up and spend t quality time with your child. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's, it's like we need both the uh, warnings, but then we also need the, uh, 
admonitions, like what are the positive things we can do to reinforce people's strength and resilience? And what are the things that we need to do to protect them from uh, being assaulted? It's, it's a two-pronged approach. And um, count us in, in uh, to your efforts and um, whatever we can do to help us spread the, the message. Uh, I, I'm a big uh, Joseph Campbell fan. I've read uh, Power of Myth and mm. grew up with uh, Bill Moyers as a friend in my family. So uh, we couldn't help but get exposed series. to that. Oh, that what a great, great series. series. Yeah, yeah. That's super. And I would say on Psych Hub side, we'll also make a commitment to making sure we have good mental health literacy around this to help educate people, because um, it's definitely a, a topic of concern. And I think this is just the beginning of what we're going to hear about it. We just don't even know the effects of what this last year did. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I'm so grateful. I think this was really interesting, and we know how busy you are. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. What is cracking, Hope Nation? It's your friendly neighborhood, Kevin Hines. And here's your brain health tip of the week. Be calm. Remaining on your toes, but cool internally, will help you stay psychologically safe. When your mind is racing, staying calm externally can help you stay grounded. In this face of adversity, struggle, or threat, being calm can help make you thoughtful, sound-based decisions for what comes next. To learn more about your own mental health and how to be a trusted resource to help others, check out PsychHub's Mental Health Allies certification and visit psychhub.com slash learning to check it all out. Go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Kevin Hines for 486 videos, all designed to help you with your mental, brain, mind, behavioral health and well-being and physical health also. So go whatever you do, be well, be kind and compassionate, loving and caring, empathetic, non-judgmental to every single person you ever come into contact with because you never know what they're going through. And be here tomorrow and every day after that. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com. Looking to grow your behavioral health practice and reach more clients who need your help? We have just the solution for you. PsychHub Provider Learning Hubs are your answer. We will train you in the greatest information on evidence-based practice delivered by industry experts in a state-of-the-art way. And at the end of it, you will earn a certification in how to use these interventions to treat anxiety, depression, insomnia, you name it. And then when you finish, you unlock a whole library of resources for ongoing learning for you as the provider, but to share with your patient. How great is it to let your patient know in a quick video, here's what to expect from your therapy session. And then any exercise or activities that happen in session, we have videos to help reinforce those skills at home for your patients, as easy as just sending a quick text or emailing them. It is a revolutionary new way to really get people through treatment, getting the best symptom results and engaging your patient along the way. Visit psychhub.com learning to get started.